And good day, good morning, everybody. Welcome into Mining Stock Daily in this week's long form episode. I'm your host, Trevor Hall, getting you through the last day of trading for this week and into the weekend. And we have an incredible conversation with one of the few real journalists following the mining sector and all the big producers throughout the world. Miss Andrea Hotter from Fast Markets joins us for a huge long conversation about what we're seeing from the major producers, geopolitical tensions, and we spend a lot of time talking about the wrecking ball that is the nickel market. Fascinating conversation with Andrew. It's one I think you'll want to listen to in its entirety. A special thank you to Fireweed Metals, Arizona Sonoran Copper, Victoria Gold, and Visa Silver for their continued support of Mining Stock Daily. And if you wouldn't mind, as always, leave a comment, like, subscribe, share with others. Uh, this is a great conversation, one that I think is really going to open some eyes for a lot of people, maybe if they don't follow the metals and mining sector. So we cover a lot of ground here. All right, everybody, have a great week, and let's get into my conversation with Andrea. All right, everybody, welcome into our long form discussion this week. I got a very special guest. In fact, it's taken me a little bit of time to get her onto the Mining Stock Daily podcast because she's quite busy. Uh, she is the special correspondent over at Fast Markets, uh, following everything mining production from all over the world. Uh, it's a fabulous beat she's on, fellow journalist. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Andrea Hodder, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Trevor, for inviting me. And I'm sorry you make, you're shaming me here that it's taken oh. a while to get our agenda, uh, well, get my agenda <laughs> aligned to, and schedule and work this out. But I'm so glad that we have. <laughs> well, in all honesty, I mean, you you said like we could talk for three hours, but I don't have three hours, so we got to narrow down the conversation. <laughs> but we are going to try to cover as much <laughs> of the stories and narratives that's going on right now in the mining sector because uh, the the entire industry has got their head on a swivel. Obviously, we have deflationary forces. We have higher interest rates. Uh, you know, the, the, these markets are cyclical in nature. So what was hot back in 2022 may not be hot right now. We'll talk more about this in a few moments. But I've got to ask you, from one journalist to the next, I mean, I know how I found this sector. It's It was very strange how I fell into it. So I got to ask you, I mean, did you wake up one day saying, you know what, I'm a journalist, I want to follow the mining market? <laughs> I can assure you I did not. In fact, I think I wanted to, well, I definitely wanted to be a war correspondent when I was little. And my, I uh, yeah. used to dress up and, and kind of wear like camouflage gear and have a notebook because I thought I was in a war zone, much to my mother's horror. So um, <laughs> I really, really did not expect to fall into the sector. If anything, it was going to be um, a foreign and political correspondent. I would have really liked to have done that. Um, and I guess you could argue there's quite a lot of that in commodities anyway. But yeah, it was just one of those things that I graduated um, in London from the University of London at King's College and I was looking for a job and I just needed to do something and I applied for a job that didn't really tell you what the company was um, mm. and it just said that if you like if you like to travel um, you know you speak a couple of languages etc you're, you're interested in the world around you this is a great job for you so I applied and when I went to the interview it was um it was Metal Bulletin, which is what Fast Markets oh. used to be called. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my word, no, I don't know anything about metal and this is going to be really dull. But again, I was, you know, 22 and wanting to 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 do something and earn some money and, and not be stuck living at home with my parents, that kind of thing. So I took the job and just didn't look back. I really mm. fell in love with the bee and the 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 kind of the... I guess the the characters in the sector, the twists and turns of the stories, and just how tangible it is really, you know, they affect everyday life, um, commodities. So yeah, yeah, that was how I got into the sector and I and I never left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh how tell me a little bit about kind of cutting your teeth as a young professional in this sector who knew very little to nothing in mining as you know, because I, I could, you and I could share stories just about the mistakes we made and the dumb questions we asked when we were first starting. Oh, 
plenty of dumb questions, but I, you know, I think there are never a dumb question, right? If you don't know something, it's better to ask than pretend you do. But I think that I was lucky. I found people along the way who were great mentors who were in the industry and really helped explain things patiently and spent the time and took the, you know, the time to do that for me, which was really, really lucky. Um, and I, I put in a lot of work trying to learn the sector, but I think more than anything, it was just, some of it was just that being in the right place at the right time. I dealt with a lot of big kind of sexy stories broke when I just got into the industry. There were massive trading scandals. There were, there were kind of oligarchs were kind of jostling for power in Russia and in Ukraine and, and Kazakhstan. And there was a huge amount of just fascinating stuff going on. And I think that, I think it just captured my attention and I, I got to do some amazing travel as well. Um, mm. I still do, but I, I was getting on planes with, with Ukrainian warlords at the time. I mean, it was just, it was a fascinating wow. period. I think when I first started and I literally went around the world, I was very, very lucky. Um, was there was there a story that um, you published that maybe put the stamp on your career to really you know chat you know to really for you to take off professionally? Um, it's hard to say, but I do think that one of the things that I got to really dig my teeth into was a a big lawsuit that involved a brokerage firm at the London Metal Exchange was being sued by one of its clients, and it was a mm over a hundred years old exchange, but there was this huge lawsuit. It spun out into all kinds of different areas. It was in the high courts in London. So I could go and sit there and actually do a lot of the court reporting, which was great and talk to both sides. And I think that it was such a big story at the time um, that it, it really kind of probably pushed me a little bit more above the parapet than it would have done if I had not had that story. So mm. whether for good or bad, um, it was definitely a, uh, a really interesting one. And I, I would say that was a, that was a, probably quite a key one yeah. for sure. I had a, a great conversation here on the podcast back in late November with Andy Holm. And he said that this period right now is the most exciting time for metals journalism he's ever seen in his 30 year career. And I kind of shook my head. It's like, well, my career is not 30 years long, but it, it is very exciting right now. So I'd love to pose that question to you. I mean, what are you seeing right now? Or do you, do you feel like this is an incredibly exciting time to be writing and reporting on the metals trade? It is. And let me just say as well, a huge shout out to Andy, because Andy is one of the people that I would credit for really helping me get my teeth into the sector. After I left Metal mm. Bulletin, I went to Bridge News and he mm. was my boss there, um, a real mentor and a friend to this day. Actually, I saw him very recently um, in London. So I, I have huge respect for him and what he does. Um, if he says that it's the most exciting period, I would therefore <laughs> say it probably is. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would, I, I, I think that I've been, I feel like I've been saying that since 2004, 2005, when that first mm. real bull run happened and the markets just really took off. That was fascinating, especially in copper, because that was the emergence of China and so on. And then we had the crash a few years later, then the comeback, then the decline again. And so that's been a real roller coaster. But I do feel like every single day now you wake up and you're not sitting there thinking, oh, it's going to be a quiet day today. Right, <laughs> Those don't right. exist anymore. I think that there are structural changes that are happening rather than cyclical ones. We're seeing the influence of technology in the markets that we never saw previously. We're seeing, you know, this jostling for, for, for I guess, dominance among um, the various participants in the sector and on the trading side. So the hedge funds, are they, you know, they're all there, but they've kind of taken this step back, but they could very quickly change things if they come back in. There's just so much going on. The exchanges are being challenged. The traditional exchanges are being challenged for their, by their, their contracts by newcomers. Um, mm. Yeah, and obviously we've seen a huge amount of, at the moment, um, kind of, just distress in the sector as the cycle sort of turns. So it's definitely a really good time to be a journalist. The LME is always a, the gift that keeps on giving. I always say with the stories from the exchange, um, not that it always tries to be, but it is. And yeah, the industry, the mining industry is just going through a huge transition. So I, I suspect 
that in five years time as well, we'll be sitting there and talking about, you know, some huge cybersecurity issue that's affecting mm -hmm. less than five years, everybody and AI and how that's impacting the sector in a much more prevalent way and obvious way than we're seeing right now. Cause I think it's just quite nascent. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I, I do want to go back and maybe talk about that cycle between the early 2000s to the run up and, uh, you know, 2012 or whatever that's that cycle was really predicated on as you said an emerging china and uh incredible construction stimulus all those things the hoarding of raw materials on their side uh and we are still waiting for that next i guess super cycle in commodities specifically in the metal side of that sector but if it's going to happen, I mean, I would love to get your thoughts here on what will predicate that next cycle, because it just doesn't seem to me it's just going to be China. There's a lot of people expecting a China stimulus, but at the same time, the world continues to deglobalize. We're talking about major infrastructure spends that needs to happen in the West. Oh, and as you mentioned, we also have this artificial intelligence, which will require massive digital infrastructure, <laughs> data centers yeah. all over the place. Uh, you know, as you, you know, with one of these major cycles under your belt here, I would expect that you're not assuming that it all uh, is similar, but there's going to be massive differences the next time this thing has jet, has jet fuel. Yeah. I mean, I think that, and it's really interesting. I do a lot of, you know, I speak a lot to mining CEOs and, and for years, all they would talk about when they wanted to talk about demand was China. Um, it's been very interesting in the last several years that their comments about China have really fallen away. And that's not mm. the kind of, well, China is the great savior for us, because I think they've recognized it isn't. And that has been, that situation has been accelerated, in my opinion, by the, um, the supply chain disruptions, which then have been exacerbated by Things like, you know, look at the tensions in, in the Red Sea, in the war in Ukraine, all of these these issues, COVID, um, et cetera. But then on top of that, the regulatory backdrop that we've got now, where governments are trying to reshore capacity, work with friendly nations and so on. And if you're in the States or in Canada or in Australia or the US you're, or the UK, you're trying to get away from your reliance on China and diversify your supply chains. And so that means China cannot be your saving grace. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I don't want to buy anything from China anymore, but we want to sell them everything. They, they have mm. to find new customers. They have to work out a way to find a new mean medium in this, in this, in this new world. And that also leads me to think that this whole, sort of reshoring diversification can't happen overnight because right. the world does still need China and it's, it's processing capacity and so on and it's consumption. However, um, something will have to change. So will it be China suddenly kind of revving its gears again? I don't think that can happen. There are now rules in place saying you don't get credits if you're doing X, Y, Z, you can sell capacity and you can sell, um, products to China, but is China going to want to buy them? I don't know. I, these are just big questions, but I do feel like something has to give. And I do think that the trade backdrop, backdrop is really important now with the regulatory side. Um, in addition to that, I think the other side is access to capital and financing. I mean, you'll know, Trevor, from your dealings with a lot of the junior mining companies that that dries up during tough times. Um, I don't think the sector's ever really caught up. And mm. there are now a lot of struggling companies. Um, there was a, a massive figure by BHP this week um, talking about, I think it was a one and a quarter trillion dollars is needed out to 2030 just for copper mm. um, to green light. I think 10 million tons of copper they were talking about. That's what they say the world needs. But last year, only I think it was just over 300,000 tons, 324, 5,000 tons was greenlit. So the financing's not there. The, the expenditure, CapEx budgets are getting blown out and companies are sort of falling by the wayside as our projects. And I think, therefore, you've got this supply side 
which is probably going to be more of a propeller than the demand side necessarily. Um, obviously, the demand's there long term, but I think if you want prices to to kind of go back to where we saw them previously, and don't forget they are still structurally a lot higher than they were, right. um, I do think we're going to need to see. Um, I don't think we're necessarily going to need to see that demand from China. I think the supply side is going to be a, a big help. Mm. You you think the supply side of this equation will push these factors into equilibrium at some point? I I think that, well, I don't know if that's going to be the case. I think it will be a massive crunch point. It will be a disaster at some point if the world does not mm. produce more of these critical minerals. That, and we're talking about copper and nickel as well as lithium and all of the other right. raw materials that we need. But that has to have an impact at some point. And I actually would argue that last year, when which was considered a bad year and commodities was the worst performing asset class and instead of the best from 2022, it was the worst in 2023. I would argue that the markets would have been in a lot worse shape if they hadn't had that supply side problem. Um, and as we are now starting to see in um, copper, you know, copper was probably a big beneficiary of that shortage last year. And that's only just starting to kick in this, the deficits are kicking in this year. I think there will be deficits again next year. Our analysts are certainly predicting that. And I think all of these factors are definitely going to provide a level of support that maybe we've talked about structural um, supply shortages for years, but there's always been a new project. I don't think with the demand that is expected um, that those supply project those projects are there and therefore i think there is a problem coming down the pipeline right um well, it copper varies mines between are, the markets mm. yeah sorry to interrupt but i mean copper mines have been shutting massive copper mines have been shutting down uh left and right for the last few months i, I we just got note that a right. val, valet operation uh in brazil is is, is halting uh this is on right. the back of uh, copa panama Obviously, massive supply coming offline. Uh, you know, the list kind of continues to go on and on. Uh, yeah. But on the economic side here, Andrew, I mean, we also have a serious problem as far as people um, on one hand saying that they see the supply, they want to capitalize uh, and invest in this side of things, but then they see the price tags to get these operations up and going. And there's like, no, the risk is too high. The the the, the interest rates are too high. You you There's no way they can fund it. So Again, yeah. like what something you're right, something has got to happen to a breaking point to where you know either the price is going to ref the price of the metal's got to reflect the cost to produce this stuff, or mm -hmm. we continue to see deflation and those costs right. come down, but that also has implications on the spot price of the metal. And so, I you know, it's just an absolute mess right now. I, and I don't it blame is. people for staying on the sideline and trying to wait for the seas to calm down. Right, exactly. I mean, I think it seems like we're at an inflection point with central bank monetary policy at the moment, mm -hmm. which should hopefully trigger an improvement to that sentiment you're talking about there. But China, I don't know. There, are, I've been listening to people talking about maybe China's lost control of its economy. Now, I never would not bet on China having control of over what it's <laughs> over its economy, right? right. But. Right. But it's definitely not kind of throwing the billions at um, a, a stimulus package that it, you would have seen maybe five, 10 years ago. It's very nuanced where they're putting their money. And I think that that's, a, that's definitely a change. Um, however, that said, this year, I believe they've called it the year of consumption prote promotion, mm. um, 2024 in China. So that bodes really well for industrial metals like copper. We hear a lot about India, but it kind of, we've been hearing about India maybe for the last decade and that hasn't really taken off in the way, I've noticed companies are starting to talk about India more, but I want to see that translate into actual solid demand. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a less, less hawkish Federal Reserve at the moment, as you noted, mm -hmm. so that can help. But I don't know, I just feel like the, the, the old rules don't necessarily apply anymore. Um, mm. we're definitely in a, a new era and that does make it exciting. So Andy's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, I think, I think you posted on Twitter. I mean, you listen to all these, uh, uh, financial calls every quarter. And I think you tweeted out that 
that it was the third company you had heard, quote, improvement in Chinese construction within their call. I can't remember if that was you or somebody else, but I think that uh, might have been somebody else. Maybe but... it was somebody else. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I think, but, but that's interesting because, you know, is that translating into anything that show me where that's, that's leading prices higher? I mean, to a certain extent, the markets are underpinned by higher prices. Copper is not running at kind of $6,000 a ton. You know, we are, we are at much more comfortable levels. You're not seeing the, the closures because of um, costs. You're seeing closures for different reasons. You're seeing closures because companies are either facing supply disruptions. We're seeing smelters close because they can't get concentrates. Um, but we're not seeing closures because companies are running out of money and the price is too low, like in nickel, um, when mm -hmm. you're talking about copper, for example. So there are nuances between the markets. Aluminium capacity is closing because the price of um, energy has been so high um I, you know so there are there are different nuances between each market and i think no size fits all for sure uh we've got to talk about nickel i want to spend some time talking <laughs> about nickel because this has just been uh it's been a wrecking ball I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, yeah. It has absolutely crushed companies' financials. I mean, everybody, including the big boys, Glencore, BHP, uh, they had quoted declining nickel prices on their sheets uh, with their challenges for twenty, you know, financially in 2023. Um, you know, this the, the high-pressure acid leach processing – uh, out of Indonesia and dumping a lot of that material into the markets cheaply is and it has been devastating. But we know markets are cyclical. This can't last forever. And so, you know, obviously you've been spending a lot of time watching the nickel trade and the processing and what's going on. So maybe you could just kind of paint a picture here with a broad brush about what you're seeing currently yeah. as we sit here. I mean, I, I, it's funny, I've written more about nickel this year than I think I ever have in my entire career. <laughs> it's yeah. just been kind of, okay, what day is it? Okay, another nickel right. story, you know. So it's been, it has been a whirlwind. And as you say, it's just absolutely nuts what's been happening. I think after being the worst performer of the, you know, on the London Metal Exchange last year, I think prices fell by over 40%. I think it was around 44%. That inevitably had a knock-on effect. You know, you've got these high-cost producers and they're high-cost because of energy and labor in regions like Indonesia um, and also in New Caledonia, sorry, not Indonesia, in Australia and in uh, New Caledonia being big areas. They really struggled to cover the cost of production. And then you've got these low cost regions and i'm particularly talking here about indonesia where nickel production has just continued to grow and we can talk about that craziness um but that's put a huge amount of pressure on the market and it has led to production cuts and you you know you mentioned vale today talking about um Sosego, uh with you know earlier with copper well we've had with nickel there have just been so many we've had wailu with um, the Cambalda operations in Australia. That had a knock-on effect with Cambalda's concentrator, which is owned by BHP. Um, there was first Quantum suspending Ravensthorpe. You had Panoramic Resources um, at Savannah Nickel, IGO at Cosmos. Last week, BHP said it was going to put Western Australian assets, which are basically all of its Nickel West, mm. on notice for care and maintenance which is wow. massive. I mean, we can go into Australia in a minute. And then New Caledonians really isn't really, really struggling too. You've got Glencore has put Connie Ambo on care and maintenance. There are problems at operations run by Eremet and Prony Resources and Trafigura. You know, so our analysts at Fast Markets estimated that 300, and I think it was 378,000 tons per year capacity has gone off because of low nickel prices. And for nickel, that's absolutely massive. And despite all of this, the market's still in a surplus, which is yeah. just crazy. Um, BHP said in its um, earnings that its base case for nickel is that it may rebalance by the late 2020s. I kind of read that and said, may rebalance? Ugh, that's awful. You know, so I think if you're in the nickel industry, you just need to buckle up. You don't always get, it's a tough business. You don't get 
these long, long cycles of, of great years, you get a couple and then you have a difficult multi-year run. And I think that that right now is being really exacerbated by what's going on in Indonesia. Um, we can dive a little bit more into Connie Ambo and, 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 and New Caledonia if you want, or I can talk about Indonesia. <laughs> well, I, I do want to, maybe let's talk about uh, people listening who, I, I think they have some familiarity. Most people have some familiarity and maybe we can just kind of dive down into exactly what is happening to create these low nickel prices um, just on the mm-hmm. technology, you know, maybe just a little bit of a background story. Yeah. Um, so Indonesia, basically very smart um, in 2020, they added nickel to the list of um, exports of ore that were not allowed to be exported anymore. In fact, they were banned. And it was all part of this effort to draw onshore investment and add value to their industrial chains. They did it with alumina, what well, bauxite to add alumina in the country. They did it with copper in order to add value to copper. So you're seeing smelting capacity going in and they've been doing it in nickel as well. A lot of these projects um, are not just Indonesian. They have a Chinese shareholding base as well. Um, they're normally Indonesian in the mining phase of it. And then the Chinese come along in the smelting and refining phases. Um, whether as a partner or a mixture of the two. Um, There are Western companies there, but I think that the majority, I can count on my hand the number of projects of scale that that have a Chinese um, ownership. And so this plus a technology change, which allowed them to um, basically, I don't want to get too technical, to, Mm. to produce the kind of nickel that nobody expected them to be able to produce um, for batteries instead of just the steel, um, shocked everybody. Um, yeah. the, the, and sulfide, n- the sulfide nickel right. and the letter. Exactly. And the letter. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Nobody thought that they could get this working. They did. And as a result, they're now they're on track to account for about 60% of global nickel supply by wow. next year and 75% by the end of the decade. And probably more potentially than 75%. You know, maybe that's a, a, a kind of a, an underestimate given how quickly they're, they're moving. So... It's been a massive issue um, for the rest of the world. Obviously, you can see the impact that that has had. It is not without its um, criticism. There have Mm. been questions over safety and environmental standards and all kinds of things. Um, There's a big issue right now, which I think will be a real test case because the Indonesian government has been very quick to reassure that there are standards because they know that they need not just to rely on China too. They want to have a diversified um, customer base and they also want to do business with the West. So they are trying to very, very much reassure the rest of the world that there are high level of standards at their operations. There there was an explosion at a furnace in December where over 20 people, I think it was 25, um, a lot died, Mm. um, which is terrible. It was a Chinese run operation um, and At the moment, we're kind of waiting to sit back and see what they do about that, because I think that's going to be a bit of a test case to see how they handle ESG. Are they going to go tough on, and the company that owns it is Xinjiang, which is the, I would suggest, potentially their biggest investor um, across the country. So, you know, that's going to be really important and a a real signal to the rest of the world, how Indonesia handles um, problems with ESG. Um, but there's a lot going on. They've just had an election as well. You know, there was a lot of question marks over who's going to be elected. Um, as it turns out, the son of the former and now, you know, the ex-president, um, Joko Widodo, who's nicknamed Jokowi, he, um, his son was the running mate for the new president. They got elected. And I think that you can, it can be very safe to say it's a bit of a continuity result. Um, if anything, potentially even more tough on making um, companies step up and um, banning exports and, and becoming tougher on companies to contribute to the local economy. Um, but definitely it's not the disruptive outcome for nickel that people expected it to be. But even so... Um, even if you are an Indonesian low cost nickel operation, at some point in this current environment, you are likely to be struggling. So I would argue that 
something's got to give to with some of those slightly higher cost um, operations on the Indonesian cost curve. Yeah, I, I so many follow up questions with this. I mean, in that <laughs> technology, you know, HPAL in in the, that processing technology, obviously, you have to sleep in the bed you made. And I just, you know, how much of this product can you dump into the market and 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 just push that price lower and lower until you've actually done yourself more harm than you've done good. I mean, what are I guess as a follow up, what's the economics of this right now? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Obviously, it's it's I don't know the data off the top of my head, and I I you know would not be the best person to ask for that. However, um, obviously, it's significantly cheaper. But I actually did an interview with the um, with one of the government ministers, and he said to me, I asked him that question, you know, about pricing at what point does this start to become a major problem um and he said we don't actually want to we're not trying to take out the market there is a point where we want our we want i think they're trying to keep their projects at a certain level <laughs> the costs at a certain level so they don't ever get too low so that they flood the market too much um because they have a break even price to those at those operations um so i think they would like to have more influence over the price um there is obviously concern about that <laughs> right. in the west too so it's a really interesting time um indonesia is launching its own prices um for nickel it's looking at doing that so i think that that situation's got to change too but yes you're right there has to be a point where they are aware that too much nickel is too much nickel, right? Right, um, right. For sure. And, 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 and there, and there is some geopolitical, um, I guess, questions that need answered here, specifically if Indonesia is looking to diversify their uh, partnerships with the West uh, because of that Inflation Reduction Act. You know, a lot of that battery-grade material has to be uh, processed through uh, – countries that have a free trade agreement with right. the United States. And I don't, I don't think Indonesia is a part of that agreement. And so is there a campaign happening as we speak with the Indonesian government uh, kind of trying to buddy up with the, uh, the Biden administration or the U.S. government right now? Sure. I mean, so Indonesia is definitely pushing to have a free trade agreement with the U.S. And that's obviously really important, as you know, because it gives it access to all of those um, EV tax credits. Mm -hmm. The country is trying to build a battery industry, not just um, mines and smelters. You know, it wants to have a battery manufacturing plant there at some point. It wants to have uh, be able to produce EVs, I think, eventually. I mean, we had a, a, a moment where we saw Elon Musk visit Indonesia and we nothing has materialized from that. But who knows in the future? Um but as you also say, yes, they have that. They've been trying to get that, but um, we've seen a lot of opposition from that in the U.S. Um, Senate. We've seen letters written um, expressing this opposition and saying, "Do not do this. This is not good." And they're arguing on the grounds of the ESG um, stuff that we talked about earlier. In other words, they do not meet the right criteria on environmental, social. And governance issues and therefore we don't want to um op we don't want to have that fta with with indonesia and also mm. bear in mind the ownership of a lot of those assets why would we want to go and put all, all of our eggs effectively in a china basket now that's the um the argument that they've been making i think what's been important within that as well is the foreign entity of control definition which is very, very important because it talks about, for the purposes of the Inflation Reduction Act, a foreign entity that's owned or controlled by um, these, what they call, I guess, a covered nation. And those covered nations are China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, right? Right. right? So those four, when we're talking about Indonesia, we're talking about China. And the definition has come out and said, if you've got more than 25% ownership or control, by China, effectively, or for an entity of concern, then you don't get those tax credits. So that in, that includes board seats, voting rights, or any equity. And so if that stays the way it is at the moment, 
a lot of those projects that are more than 25% owned by Chinese companies will not be eligible for tax credits. So there's, even if they get the free trade agreement, there's going to have to be some, quite a lot of maneuvering um, potentially, and maybe that will happen, clever restructurings of equity stakes or board seats to try to take ownership lower than 25%. I don't think that's going to be possible across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, And therefore, everyone's expecting this big wave of capacity to come and hit the EV market. It won't necessarily. It can still be there, but it's not going to have that free trade agreement, um, the access to the IRA credits and the tax credits as a result. So that pushes up the cost. And that's not something that those projects are really looking for. So I think it's it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. There's definitely a lot of pressure um, not to do this free trade agreement. But at the same time, if a country accounts for, by the end of the decade, 75% of the world's nickel production, and that's before we account for all the rest of it that's being taken into care and maintenance right now, it could be greater right. than that, then they're going to have to get, have to do business with Indonesia in some way. So that situation is yet to to kind of fully play out. But I do think, you know, it's it's not as straightforward as it may seem. Uh, you don't think subsidizing projects within... U.S., Canada, or some of our, you know, free trade agreement partners, other countries is a solution if they are going to turn their back on Indonesia? Well, you can, you can okay, so look, let's look what the Australian government's doing right now. Mm. So you've got all of these nickel projects are in an absolute mess. And they've said, okay, this week we'll put nickel on the critical minerals um, list which they haven't done before, which is kind of mind boggling, um, which opens <laughs> which opens up its coffers for the mineral to access financing um, that they that is held back for those raw materials. So that gives them access to the, I think it's $4 billion, a critical minerals facility and to grant programs that are for critical mer- minerals. So in this case, nickel. Is that going to be enough? No. Is it going to be in time? No. Um, They also said that they would provide, and you talked about subsidies, um, rebates um, and royalty relief, right? So they've said that's coming in from March for 18 months. That's great. But when that period ends, it's got to be repaid within 24 months. Hmm. So this relief is short term and very, very temporary. And it's going to cost them. They're not doing this um, without expecting some money back. So what happens when that money ends? I don't know. They've got to hope that the price has picked up enough. But if you listen to what BHP said this week, we're talking about the end towards the end of the decade before we see the market back to where they need it to be to be sustainable given current prices. So I don't know. It's a difficult one. No government wants to see workers put out of um, jobs either. So there's that pressure too. Right. Um, Right. But... Um, this relief for these projects isn't necessarily going to going to do the the trick. I mean, New Caledonia is a great example of that. We've seen, um, I think it was last year, so it's a French territory. The French government said that it needs at least an emergency cash injection of 1.6 billion for the three companies, the three nickel big main nickel companies there. So that's Glencore. Um, Aramet and Prony Resources and Trafigura. And so Glencore's already put its assets on care and maintenance, Connie Ambo, and said, we're out. We're selling the stake and we're not putting any more money into it. Um, find us a buyer. We, you know, we're looking for a buyer. Um, Aramet effectively said, we're not going to put any more money into these operations either. They said that at the end of the last year, they got an emergency loan for a year mm. to keep it going. Um, and then we've had uh, Prony Resources. Well, I don't know. This has not been confirmed by Trafigura, but we understand that they're also seeking financial assistance from the French government and maybe even a new investor because Trafigura has equally said, I'm not just throwing endless money into this pit, <laughs> quite literally. No. Um, and so we've heard, and I don't know if this is confirmed, that they have received a an emergency state-backed rescue loan and an energy subsidy to keep them operations funded till the end of 2026. But what happens after this point? You know, New Caledonia is a high fuel environment. 
it's got coal and freight costs that are significantly higher because of the location and that's the energy source they rely on. And they've been, they face political tensions for a long time. Plus, you know, going back to technology, these projects are hard. Um, they've taken a really long time to get to this stage and they have not ever yielded the operational results that the companies had hoped. Um, it, there was a very entertaining um, comment made a decade ago by the Glencore head of Nickel um, at the time. And he talked about Connie Ambo having thrown billions of dollars at it and it would have produced a teacup of Nickel. And they said when they put it in care and nature, maintenance recently that they have never ever realized a profit there for the over 10 years that they've been funding it and they've funded in this 10 years in this decade um i think it's four billion and more wow. than nine billion has gone into the project since inception and it's still it's still nowhere near where it needs to be to reach the capacity and they and they're out so wow. it begs the question how much money is going to be enough to get these operations up and running uh, nobody ever said mining was easy, specifically right. the miners. Um, yeah. You know, and I wonder where that breaking point is when you go from, you know, running on fumes, putting this on care, putting those projects or the like on care and maintenance, and needing emergency funds just to even do that. I mean, where where do you get to the point where listen, we're on downright closure. We're closing these things. We're we're done, and we're never coming back. We're gonna you know, <laughs> we're going to refurbish yeah. this thing. When does well, that I'm, happen? I know. I mean, it sounds like it's happening for some of these companies, right? Obviously right, right. Was enough was enough for Glencore. It's out. I mean, let's see what happens with, with Prony's resources and, and the assets there, because maybe traffic era decides it's out. Maybe um, this is a good time to be savvy, look forward and say the world's going to need nickel. Look at all the backdrop that we've talked about with Indonesia and, and the reliance and the need to diversify. Maybe this is a good time for m and if you've got the money mm -hmm. and you've got a big, deep pocket. And I, you know, I was thinking about this. I was kind of, where is that money going to come from? We've seen a lot of interesting critical minerals from Saudi Arabia and their sovereign wealth fund has been very, very active. Maybe they're a potential buyer. Um, maybe a Chinese firm steps in, but is that going to happen in Australia through the through the approvals process? I don't know. Mm. Um, maybe who knows? You know, I think it comes down to the sort of the ethical decision versus the we need to protect jobs. Who knows? Um, maybe we see private equity focused on critical minerals. You know, Mick Davis Vision Blue Resources. Um, the the Connie Ambo asset in um, New Caledonia was actually Extrata's when he was the CEO there before Glencore acquired them. So maybe they come back in, but again, and he is focused on critical minerals, but how deep a pit do you need to keep plowing money into operations unless somebody can see some kind of amazing, something I can't see at the moment. Um, and obviously these companies can't see Otherwise, they'd be doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And unless there's a massive turnaround in, uh, you know, the pricing of these markets and the cost environment for these markets and the backdrop of supply and, and the pressures we're seeing on the market, and also a pickup in EV demand as well, which will come, but it's not, that hasn't helped. <laughs> it's in the, right? last couple of week, <laughs> in the last couple of weeks, it seems like it's been uh, decreasing. Uh, you know, that, that's obviously going to be cyclical as well. Not everybody buys a brand new vehicle every year. So. Right, exactly. So. so I think there's so much that's going into this. But yeah, I think we are starting to see um, a really kind of interesting time. And Nicole is just, Nicole is taking the brunt of so much at the moment. Um, yes, it is. Let's it, see it's... what also happens. Don't forget sanctions. Um, oh, yeah. that's going to be really interesting, you know, <laughs> if H pal wasn't enough for you, now we can talk about sanctions with, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're waiting to see if there, if nickel is added to the sanctions list. I mean, it hasn't been. And I think a lot of that is because of this reliance on these assets that are there. And maybe that's a deterrent. Maybe that pushes the, pushes everybody away from, you know, the governments of the West away from sanctioning Russian nickel. They haven't mm -hmm. sanctioned Russian aluminium. They haven't sanctioned Russian copper. They've done a little bit around the edges with steel and some copper executives um, actually 
um, were sanctioned by the UK today, but nothing crazy significant. But if you think about it, um, 47%, the LME data, I looked this up, the LME data shows that 47% of their stock is now Russian in across their warehouses. 90% of aluminium in their warehouses is Russian. Um, 36% of nickel is Russian. 37% is Australian at the moment. Um, wow. And copper, 46% of copper in LME warehouses is Russian. So if that material is sanctioned and suddenly nobody's allowed to move it, that will be a very interesting situation. Um, when the UK issued sanctions, they, they got lucky that there was no Russian metal whatsoever sitting in their warehouses in the UK. But if the US does it and if and if Europe does it, that could be a very different situation. Um, you would hope that, well, it depends what your, your view is, whether you want to kind of go for the jugular. But if you're a consumer of any of these products, you're probably hoping that they issue licenses to allow you to do business with the trade deals that you already have that exist currently. Right. Um, but it's going to restrict the warranting of, of material after the day those sanctions are issued. And that's that's pretty big. So mm -hmm. everybody is now looking to see what could happen there. Um, you know, the LME is not going to do anything unilaterally. It's going to wait to see... Um, what governments do and act in line with international sanctions. It doesn't have to, but it will. Um, it will with the US because, you know, its contracts are in dollars. The EU it has less pressure to necessarily respond to impose those sanctions. They wouldn't necessarily be binding on the LME, but um, I would imagine the pressure's there. And then what? Do we see the contracts um, basically suspended? I mean, that would be incredible. Um I'm not saying they're going to go that far, but it would be a scenario. Yeah. Um, it, it's, who knows? You, know, you think back the last two years here, Andrea, and the moment Russia invaded Ukraine, the LME has been at the center of this geopolitical deglobalization absolute shit show. <laughs> <laughs> I Yep. <laughs> and, it, and, and everything, it just, the way the world works, it all, it just seems like majority of it funnels through the LME as far as, you know, metals and resources go. And they have, you know, they go from this nickel debacle that happened two years ago where they just absolutely messed that up to now we have a nickel market that's in the gutter and it didn't take that long to do it. I mean, Hey, what what does an LME do? I mean, I I I I guess I have a little bit of sympathy for them. You know, it's this, this legendary institution. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and uh. I think look, let's you know, we could we could spend another hour talking about right. what happened in in March 2022. And I actually come down on the side of whether it was right or wrong, they had the right to suspend that contract and cancel those trades because their rule book says it, right? So that's my opinion. Not everybody will agree with it, but that's that's the rules, them's the rules, right? So mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's the way that is. Um, they have done a lot. They got slapped on the wrist very publicly. They probably will get slapped on the wrist by the regulators further, but they have kind of, they've been cleared in the courts of of acting inappropriately, um, they've upset the fund community because, you know, if you had your trades cancelled and you were on the other, on the on the positive end of that trade, you would not be a very happy person. But um, was that the LME's fault that the market went in that direction? You know, they're there as a platform. Um, some people think it is. So, I, you know, again, we could we could talk the we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. But yeah, you're right. They have they have been doing things since then to try to fix it. And I have to say, mm -hmm. volumes are up significantly compared to where they were. So that's a really positive thing. Um, but yeah, it's just when I said that it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's exactly <laughs> what I meant. It there is always something that they are struggling with, and I I feel huge sympathy actually for them yeah. because one one day it's this the next day it's sanctions then it you know it's always something um and i suppose that's that them's the breaks when you're the biggest kind of non-ferrous trading exchange in the world but it's yeah. 
it's a tough job being the CEO of the LME, I would imagine. <laughs> I am sure it is. I, I actually kind of miss when when that debacle happened in the spring of 2022. The the most iconic photo was that like circle red couch. It's the only photo of the LME anybody ever had in any of their reporting. And so it's like, cue the red couch because <laughs> like, <laughs> that is the LME. That's, for some reason, that, that red couch is the LME. That's the only thing I re like the visually what I can like picture when somebody mentions the LME. It's not like warehouses of metal. It's the red couch. Yeah. <laughs> I love those red couches. I was very lucky actually the day that that all went down in March 22, I was actually at the LME for a meeting. Oh, wow. And so during the suspended nickel ring, I went down and took a picture. And I have a picture of the couch with the nickel clock in the background <laughs> and there's nobody sitting there. So it was the empty couch during that suspended time. But it was, it, that was an amazing kind of roller coaster ride. And, um, you know, the, the repercussions of it have been far reaching. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate that nickel is right at the center of all this crazy stuff um the lme has been bashed in the last week or two by bhp and glencore who've said that one of their efforts to that they got criticized for was that there weren't enough brands um that could be delivered against the lme contract right that was one of the big problems with this um problem in march 2022 that the indonesian um capacity wasn't that the nickel wasn't the right kind of nickel to be delivered so they opened up brands um, to those projects in Indonesia, and now they're being slammed for doing that, something that everybody thought was a great idea. And now they're being slammed for doing that <laughs> because that capacity is coming into warehouses and they're saying, this is a problem. It's flooding the market with Indonesian nickel, and this is adding to the pressure. You know, remember, everybody, the LME is not a producer, so they're just a platform. So it's if the those stocks are meant to be there as a market for last resort. So don't get too excited. Be careful what you wish for. If you wanted more material in, in warehouses, you've got it. That's that's supply demand. That's not the where the LME's fault, but they are still getting bashed for it. So I don't think they can win. <laughs> yeah. I uh, got a few minutes left. I, I do want to ask you, sure. um, maybe pick your brain a little bit more uh, coming down the food chain and the uh, development and exploration stories on the back of the major producers. Uh, you know, 2023 was quite interesting, uh, despite markets just absolutely being in the tank for the last two years uh, on the metal side. Um, not, you know, not the tech, not tech sector, but uh, the, the real stuff. Uh, we did see a lot of these the major global metal producers start taking strategic investments, partnerships, and some of the bigger, well-known uh, exploration development projects in the West. Uh, we can talk about multiple things in Vicuña District in Argentina, Rio Tinto, still kind of dabbling the waters in Yukon. Um, you know, not that this is necessarily the beat you follow, but I just maybe if you did any sort of questioning as far as you know, their ability to think or need to think 30, 40 years down the road. And why is now the time to start kind of picking away at some of those ideas? I mean, okay, so that's what they do. That's what those big companies do. When, um, right now, they will have tightened their belts. So exploration is the first thing that goes. So they rely on these companies to continue to do that work as long as they can. So that when they when they have the ability to go back out there, they've still got these projects that have been developed and they can go in at different stages with equity stakes. And I think that's what we're seeing. Um, part one, part two, my second point on that would be that, you know, you talk about looking down the line, permitting, permitting takes a decade or more for, for projects with critical minerals in the U S mm. um, it's really lengthy and ridiculous. And it's the same in many other jurisdictions. And if it's going to take that long, they need to think 20 years out. Um, you know, from start to finish, these projects are taking 15 to 20 years. So if we're talking about needing all of these millions, 10 million tons by the, of copper by the end of the decade, they should have started 30 years ago. Right. Um, that's a huge number of massive new mines. So they're not there. And that's what we were talking about earlier with the supply crunch that's definitely looming. Um, so exploration companies have a critical role to play. I think that gets forgotten though on the financing side because everybody expects them to have just survived these troughs in the same way that um, 
the the big miners turn off capacity. They expect these guys to be able to keep going and, and continue their exploration. But as you know, from your conversations with these people, it's not that simple. They need mm. capital. A lot of projects fall away. Look at TSX 10 years ago and look at it now. You know, you see the peaks and the troughs of the listings and it's it's evident that um, there are good projects out there. And equally, there are bad ones. They'll fall away naturally. Um, but I think that seeing majors coming and taking stakes in projects earlier than they may have done previously is a really positive thing because it prevents mm -hmm. them from falling away. They recognize that there are peaks and troughs. If you were a lithium miner, right now is a terrible time to be kind of on your own as an explorer. Whereas if you have got a big um, a big or a medium to large size mining company as a backer or private equity or whatever it may be, um, you've got a lifeline that can keep you going when for longer when times are tough. So I think that aspect is really important. And I think that's a slight difference if you're talking about the timing of them coming in and taking these projects now rather than waiting till they have these great results. They're taking more risks, um, but I think they have to. I really yeah. do. Um, and that's a good thing for the for the juniors. It's a really good thing for the juniors. Um, well, it was they need interesting. Th this morning we got news out of Newmont. I mean, we, a lot of this conversation has been focused on, you know, critical minerals, base, base metals. In the gold space, Newmont announced that they were going to divest from six big projects, try to raise a couple billion dollars from divesting. And it includes like currently operating mines, Eleanor, Cripple Creek, and Victor in Colorado. Uh, and obviously there's some later stage exploration development projects within that list. Um, and so it's not, so it's not just like the Glencores and BHPs that are stricken with bad nickel <laughs> prices. I mean, the, the gold producers are absolutely having to deal with higher inflationary costs and they're taking losses on their financials over 2023. I mean, so it's, you know, it, this wrecking ball is <laughs> running yeah. its course throughout all of mining. It's not just the deflationary base metals. Right. And I think the interesting thing will be at what point does it turn? You know, if you've still got, um, if, if you've got majors like BHP saying nickel prices are still going to be in the doldrums in, in a several years time, you know, then that, that sector could be in a very different shape in six months, let alone in several years time. That's, that's, you know, could be potentially disastrous for many of these projects, but are we going to see a wholesale cyclical upturn or are we going to see individual markets start to move and to their own, to the tune of their own supply demand mm. fundamentals and kind of break away from that pack? That might be the way things go. I don't know when the flood of money comes into commodities, it lifts everything. <laughs> um, but um, you do tend to see a shakeout. And I think if, if you are a long-term if you have a long-term view, then great. You know, these markets are going to come back and everybody knows we need the the critical minerals. But um, yeah, they're, they're, I, how this how this ends, I don't know right now. This wrecking ball, <laughs> where, it, where it lands, um, uh, it's, it is a mess. It is a real mess. I've always, you know, my thesis has always been a actual recession would create a reset in this metal space. Uh, we're just kind of waiting for that to happen. Um, have you had any, you know, thoughts, discussions on ramifications of an actual recession in the West, and if that would maybe, you know, tame the waters a little bit for the next move higher? I think everybody feels like we've passed those days to a certain extent. That there was that really? concern about recession. I mean, UK is maybe my home country is maybe a bit of an exception in terms of recession, but um, you know, I think that. If you look at the U.S. economy, it's it seems to be out of the danger territory waters. You know, it's avoided a recession. If you look at the other major economies around the world, I don't think that there is that concern that there was, particularly as we start to enter this slightly more deflationary environment, or at least know that we're not necessarily getting to a more inflationary environment. Um, but... Um, would a recession reset things? Yeah, it does. I mean, it does. It has to, right? You've got to hit a low. What goes up must come down and so on. But um, I don't necessarily know that that's around the corner. 
anything's pulled. I'm going to be on record now saying that, and then obviously that's going to happen. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I don't necessarily think that that's around the corner, and the data doesn't suggest it's around the corner. Um, what I what I think is that we're just everyone's still nervous that you know this. Mm-hmm. We should be seeing a more risk on approach. Um, because of the factors we've just talked about, you know, slightly more stimulus, more deflationary environment, economies looking stronger, jobs data looking pretty good, year of consumption promotion in China, et cetera. But we have not yet seen that. Um, and I think everything is playing to the tune of fundamentals for the individual markets rather than the bigger macro backdrop. And that's only providing a sort of a, a slight um, kind of, support so where things go i don't know if china suddenly comes in um incredibly bullish and you know starts buying everything in sight then that's a different that's Mm. a different story um but i don't think that that seems to be its mo right now um it doesn't seem to be trying it's definitely not trying to stimulate its housing and real estate sector in terms of building more right it doesn't need to do that he needs to rescue the companies that are active in it so that's not good for steel it's not good for copper and and so on um you know there's there's so many different facets to this right now but i think i wish i had a crystal ball i think i need one (laughs) i think i definitely need one but yeah i mean who knows well, there's there's very few people in this world that has an ear to the ground in this beat quite like you do. And so I'm really thankful that we could spend some time discussing because your work is incredible. Uh, your Twitter feed is a must, even if you don't read all of the articles <laughs> and columns you put out in, on Fast Markets. Uh, you can go follow her on Twitter, which is excellent snippets from the news of the day and at Andrea Hotter. Uh, I appreciate you so much. Thanks for all the great work. And I hope we can do this again and, and uh, in due time. Absolutely. I've really enjoyed our chat and I, I will do better at making sure my schedule is like, right, we're <laughs> doing this on this day. We'll get it in the diary next time. <laughs> oh, I, I tell you what, if you just saw my diary, it would be, it's, it's an absolute <laughs> mess. So you probably did me a favor by <laughs> punching a few weeks. All right, all right Andrea, have, have yourself a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you.